All right, folks, we're going to get started. So uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, the web conference. Uh, today we have actually two speakers. Uh, 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 we're, we're pleased uh, to have uh, sort of collaboration here. So uh, as part of uh, the management of acute liver failure, we really rely on our colleagues from the neurosurgery side and neurology to sort of help guide us through this, uh, to you know, save these patients from neurologic disaster. So uh, we have two speakers here, Neha Dagnyash and uh, uh, Alex Reynolds. Um, I think Neha, you're going to start us off. Mm -hmm. Neha uh, wears a lot of hats. Uh, she's the co-director of the Neurosurgical ICU, where many of our patients are, uh, as well as uh, the systems director of NEMAT. Right? I'm going to talk to you about what NEMAT about is. <laughs> yes. um, and so we're pleased to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, what an honor speaking to all of you. And we've we worked closely with uh, with a lot of you in the room, and uh, especially Dr. Shiano over the last uh, last few months. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you a brief snapshot into what our system-wide approach for neurocritical care is, and what this neuro emergencies management and transfers program entails. So the mission of our program is to advance clinical care, research, and education throughout the health system for all neuro emergencies. And how do we truly provide uh, high fidelity throughput uh, for all, all patients with neuroemergencies in this, in this robust uh, urban health system. So when you think about a neuroemergency, it's essentially any neurological or neurosurgical emergency that requires multidisciplinary management right from the hyperacute to the acute phase to the reintegration of somebody back into their life roles in society. So a common example would be acute ischemic stroke or traumatic brain injury. So our biggest guiding principles are how do we get the right patient, the right care at the right time every single time. And as, as you can imagine, that takes a lot of, lot of different team members. We're leveraging the centers of excellence model that the Department of Neurosurgery has deployed throughout the health system. And what it entails is essentially cohorting the care of certain disease types at specific sites within our hospital. So rather than functioning like a hub and spoke model, we function like a multi-hub and multi-spoke model. So essentially, there are two neuro ICUs within the health system at the present moment. So when we try to cohort care for specific disease processes, for example, the intra intracerebral hemorrhages, we try to create a center of excellence at Mount Sinai West because there's a minimally invasive ICH evacuation program there. All the subarachnoid hemorrhage, hemorrhages within the health system and beyond, we try to cohort their care at uh, MSH neuro ICU. So by bringing the same types of diseases, the same types of patients to, to one site, we are providing not just very effective care, but also leveraging that for also building clinical research programs and also a continuous performance improvement and quality assurance program. Uh, in 2017, our total number of health trans, uh, transfers for neuro emergencies within the health system doubled, and we, we exceeded uh, 1,000 in 2018 and 2017 consistently. In terms of time and resources, so what is, how does that centers of excellence model translate into what we're doing for neurocritical care? So besides providing contemporary neurocritical care, we're also doing this inter-hospital transfer work, not just for the health system, but for the tri-state area as well as beyond. So we also do international transfers. Where we've also developed a neurocritical care hospitalist service and a con consultative service. A tele neurocritical care program that is currently being developed and a post ICU recovery clinic where the Thrive, SCCM Thrive, uh, Thrive site for a post ICU recovery clinic. But none of this is possible without really having uh, very strong partnerships with not just uh, several divisions within neurology, neurosurgery, but throughout uh, within emergency medicine, radiology, uh, nursing, environmental services, transfer services, so on and so forth. So it takes a lot of different team members, a lot of moving parts, but we've been really, really uh, fortunate to have some great collaborators uh, like yourselves. So the program structure leverages uh, disease and site-specific team members and leadership, as well as um, we use a triage, triage flowchart to, uh, to essentially cohort care as well as optimize our resources throughout the health system. The tools that we're using, some of them are evidence-based, some of them are to generate our own evidence and take the field forward. And I'm going to speak to you a little bit about uh, how we're developing and disseminating some of these evidence-based protocols. Alex is specifically going to delve, do a deep dive into how we developed uh, the fulminant hepatic failure protocol and a proposal uh, which will be circulated to everybody in critical care, uh, liver medicine, uh, 
for, for liver surgery and everybody who interfaces with these patients for their input and guidance. So for each of these protocols, as you can imagine, they're multidisciplinary teams. So each of these protocols first underwent a deep literature dive and then were presented to different team members for their input, as well as what is really fe feasible, uh, what can really be done with our existing resources and where do we need to create capacity. This phone number, I would highly recommend that you feed this phone number into your phones and save it. It's a 1-800 number. We couldn't come up with a cool 1-800 NEMAT, but <laughs> nevertheless, we didn't have we didn't have the words NEMAT uh, into being. It came into being only uh, a year and a half ago. Um, but the 1-800 number, 7486445, it's a 24-7 hotline for neurocritical care. Um, when you call this hotline, you will either get a neurocritical care attending, a senior neurocritical care fellow, or a senior neurocritical care advanced practice provider. And the purpose of this hotline, of course, uh, I'm speaking to you about all this triage that we're doing and into hospital transfers. But more recently, we've also developed a consult service uh, every day. Um, for five days of the week, we have two attendings uh, who are on for MSH, Neuro ICU. Uh, there's an NSICU 1 attending and an NSICU 2 attending. After 5 p.m., the NSICU 1 attending is the attending manning this hotline. So when you call for a consult for an incoming uh, potential uh, liver transplant patient, you're going to get somebody who's going to deploy additional resources to come and see your patient and to help you, uh, help you get day zero baseline um, baseline evaluations that Alex will go more into. So some of the reasons why we are getting consulted, these are some common indications, suspected ICP crisis or herniation, patients who are in newly diagnosed status epilepticus, uh, fulminant hepatic failure, post cardiac arrest prognostication, any coma of unclear etiology. I must emphasize though, that this is not to supersede the general neurology consult or the stroke codes that need to be called. This is to provide an additional level of support both for enhancing throughput, providing more effective care, but at the same time, all of those pathways, you need a fulminant hepatic failure patient who's on the floor, who's, who's being transitioned to an ICU. You need that patient evaluated. You're still going to call your rapid response team or they're beginning to seize. You're still going to call rapid response first to secure their airway, so on and so forth, and then make this call to us to, to co-manage the patient. Just some numbers to give you an idea of how this program has actually evolved over the course of the last three years. Um, besides the health system, as you can see, we do have a large proportion of patients that are coming from other hospitals as well beyond the health system. And one of the biggest things that this program has been able to do, in addition to all this volume, we've also been able to really improve our uh, inter-hospital transfer times. For example, for, for subarachnoid hemorrhage, where we've been able to reduce the transfer times from 2017 when we first deployed the program in its, in its full strength from 310 minutes to about 141 minutes uh, for any subarachnoid hemorrhage that presents within the health system and beyond. So we're continuously creating capacity. We're in this process of QA and performance improvement, um, really working with our collaborators and partners like yourselves to really get better at how we're providing care to our patients. So the right care for the right patient, right time, every single time. So that's our mission. And uh, with that, I will let Alex delve into fulminant hepatic failure. Thanks. Can I have a quick question before you transition? Mm -hmm. The number that you gave, does that also supersede, like let's say we have fulminant coming in the ICU and you have, you know, we have other resources to contact the neurosurgical fellow, the access to the first line through, all, through MION and things mm -hmm. like that. Does that, should we still use the internal, you know, MION capabilities or should we use that, that phone for a consult? What a new consult? For a patient who needs a baseline assessment, I would highly recommend that you call this phone. So once you call the phone, this consult will get logged in, even if the attending who's holding the phone is not in house, this is in the middle of the night, we'll send a neuro ICU fellow or ADP to come and assess the patient and do some baseline assessments. Okay. Um, so I'm going to speak primarily on um, fulminant hepatic failure. Um, and actually, that was one of the. It's one of my favorite diseases, despite the fact that I'm a neurologist in training, which is embarrassing to say. Um, but uh, I'll I'll show you two cases from my residency and fellowship that really made me interested in this disease process. So you're you're going to hear me lapse into fulminant, even though I know we're supposed to call it acute liver failure. But just fulminant just strikes me as a, a much more descriptive word for how bad this disease is. And just as a reminder, um, you know. Uh, up to a quarter of patients are going to die from neurological issues. 
Um, and, you know, it, even the patients in multi-organ system failure may have significant neurological issues as well. Um, and this is obviously a potential lethal disease, but it also has a potential cure. And there's a potential for rapid recovery of these young patients. And that's why it's something that's lacking in most neurological diseases. Um, and that's what's really um, kind of piqued my interest. So this was actually a case I had when I was a PGY2. Um, where I trained, we kept acute liver failure patients in our neuro ICU for neuromonitoring. And so we got to take care of these patients. So this was a 28-year-old woman who um, presented after a suicide attempt um, and initially had gone to an outside hospital where she had a CT head that was negative for cerebral edema. At that point, she was intubated, but she was able to follow commands and kind of interact. Um, after three days in the outside hospital, she was transferred to our center for um, consideration of liver transplant because of worsening labs. And when I met her, her eyes were open. She was very agitated, not tracking or attending, not following. Um, but she had all her cranial nerves. Um, her clinical course got significantly worse. She ended up requiring um, significant sedation and even paralysis for development of ARDS. Um, and so we really had no exam on her anymore except her pupils. And we were using non-invasive measures to, to watch her intracranial pressure. Um, and so we did a repeat head CT on day eight when, you know, things started to look worse. So on the top is, you know, her CT head from the day that she came in, um, which is fairly normal for someone of her age. Um, and you can see by day nine the relevant things, which you all probably can point out to me without. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Got it. So um, she's got effacement of all her sulci, right? She had beautiful sulci and gyri here. She's got effacement of that. You can see some blood. She's got both intraparenchymal and subarachnoid blood. Um, and she's got, um, again, you can see like really no sulci. Um, and so this was diffuse cerebral edema with some hemorrhage. Um, this case was the last liver case I saw as a fellow. Um, she was a 36-year-old woman with von Willebrands and VSD, um, and she presented after developing confusion and was diagnosed with autoimmune uh, hepatitis. On exam, she was initially agitated, lethargic, um, mumbling nonsensically, and so she was intubated. Um, these were her initial labs. And, um, you know, her exam, as usual, worsened to the point where she wasn't opening her eyes anymore, off sedation, minimal withdrawal in her arms. And uh, as we were following her with um, some non-invasive measures, her exam began to worsen. And at its worst, she actually developed um, localizing, uh, pro uh, localizing symptoms. So she was having roving eye movements. She had a weak corneal on the right and an absent one on the left. She had an incomplete and delayed uh, oculocephalic reflex. And so uh, me and my attending were sure that there was something intracranially that was going on because she now had focal symptoms. Uh, and focal loss of brainstem reflexes. And so we did a head CT, and you can see, this is actually not a normal head CT for a 30-something-year-old. Um, so she's got quite a bit of atrophy, which we attributed to her um, uh, history of a VSD that was not treated in a timely manner when she was a child. She probably had some chronic brain hypoxia <coughs> as a child. But you can see here, there's really no difference between day one and day five. And this is a CT that was obtained while she had an absent corneal on one side. And you can see her brainstem's got a ton of room around it. So this was not cerebral edema. So it just goes to show you, you know, there are two patients that have, you know, pretty significant liver disease. One has significant issues with intracranial pressure, um, did clinically herniate, and had intraparenchymal hemorrhage. And then another one had really no neurological issues. Um, and we were really unable to tell the difference um, just by exam. So what is it about these two patients that um, would allow us to predict who's going to worsen. Um, so, you know, quickly, I'll t the outline for today will be the, you already know the neurological complications of acute liver failure. I'll just show you some uh, interesting data. And then um, how we can monitor these patients, and then a proposal after, um, at the end of this, for you guys to consider. Um, so, of course, the hallmark of um, acute liver failure is encephalopathy, and we all know the West Haven criteria. Um, there's an interesting group in um, Hanover, Germany, who's been working on subclinical encephalopathy, um, or grade zero encephalopathy, which may not be picked up on our traditional bedside exams, but, you know, have some more complex um, 
uh, tasks. So, you know, like a Trails B type situation here or um, trying to do like a decoding. Um, so these are things that, you know, traditionally they, they picked up patients who were thought to have acute liver injury without encephalopathy, but actually did have neurological deficits on these exams. So it's an interesting thought, you know, whether we're actually missing some very, very subtle neurological um, changes. So the causes of encephalopathy are, of course, <laughs> Um, a lot. I'll just highlight a couple of points. So, you know, astrocytes in general can help detoxify ammonia, um, and that's by converting glutamate to glutamine. Um, obviously, when that's not happening in the periphery by the muscles in the liver, um, the astrocytes get exposed to too much ammonia, and they can swell and develop astrocytosis. And once they do that, they stop um, doing reuptake of glutamine, and that can lead to glutamine toxicity. Um, on the other hand, GABA, which is an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter, is usually created by gut bacteria and is metabolized by the liver. And once the liver stops working, you can get excess GABA. And so you can get both excitotoxicity and an excess of in inhibition, um, which can be kind of confusing. Um, and that may suggest why some patients are more likely to get seizures than others, and which we'll talk about in a little bit. So you guys know how to treat encephalopathy. In fact, you know, Lactulose, rifaximin, we usually shy away from lactulose in the patients who may be surgical candidates. And then, of course, nursing care for altered patients. Um, stroke and intracranial hemorrhage, we're always really, really worried about because these patients come in with INRs through the roof. Um, but we know that actually most patients with liver function, a dysfunction, even though they have abnormal INRs, they're both you know, pro and anti-thrombotic. Uh, and they clot and bleed. And if you do thromboelastography on these patients, they actually most often have somewhat of a normal tag, maybe not because of uh, fibrinogen uh, deficiency, but we never really know where they are on the clotting bleeding spectrum because we're also intermittently giving them products prior to procedures. So in the literature, if you look, there's actually almost no data on rates of hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke in the absence of putting in an intracranial monitor. Um, and so when I was still a fellow, I started working um, with an attending of mine who has access to the nationwide inpatient sample, looking at um, patients who had a uh, Tylenol overdose, um, who were, you know, in an ICU, which we, uh, and we kind of estimated grade of encephalopathy based on whether they were on mechanical ventilation at the time or not. Um, and we looked for coding of ischemic stroke and intracranial hemorrhage, and actually, the rates are extremely low, less than 1%. So even though we're always worried about it, I think that kind of mimics our clinical experience that these patients, you know, we get head CTs all the time when they have changes and they very rarely have, you know, large strokes or hemorrhages. But when they do, it's really hard to tell who's going to be that person. Um, you know, in terms of why patients develop stroke or hemorrhage, it's, these are usually young patients. They don't have the traditional stroke risk factors. And so we think that these patients either have altered autoregulation, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, they have endothelial activation and development of microthrombi. So they're not the, the classic embolic strokes that we see in the older populations. And then you can get secondary strokes from high intracranial pressure. Um, moving on to seizures. The true incidence of seizures is a little unclear. And that's because, as you guys all know, there are a lot of different movement disorders that um, are seen in these patients that can be confused for seizure. Um, and not every institution uses EEG. However, in two pretty good studies on using an, uh, prophylactic antiepileptics, um, these two studies both used EEG on all their patients, and they found rates of anywhere from a quarter to a third of patients having electrographic seizures. So that's actually yeah. quite high. Um, you know, when I was being taught in early residency, I was told that these patients should actually be protected from seizures because there's all this excess GABA. And so um, you know, these are patients who respond to flumazenil when you give it, right? These are patients who should not be seizing, but we obviously know that that's not true. And so they're, you know, again, I told you about the glutamine toxicity. There's this hypothetical kind of epileptogenesis from that. Um, you know, we always talk about structural injuries, but I told you that's very uncommon. But the most common reason is that <clears throat> these patients have severe metabolic abnormalities that we know cause seizures. They're extremely uremic, hyponatremic, hypoglycemic. And these are all reasons for patients to seize. And they don't necessarily have to have generalized seizures. They can have focal seizures um, you know, for different reasons. So it's always something to kind of think in the back of your mind. 
There is no role for prophylactic anti-epileptics. There were two studies done, both studying phenytoin, which obviously in this day and age would not be our um, ideal anti-epileptic. Um, if patients do have seizures, we usually recommend uh, Keppra because it's mostly renally dosed. Um, and then small doses of benzodiazepines or propofol. Um, other uh, medications that are renally dosed uh, may cause a lot of problems. So like topiramate and zanisamide um, can both cause a pretty severe metabolic acidosis. So we actually try to stay away from those medications uh, just because patients usually have some component of renal dysfunction already and they're already quite acidotic. I'd also add that I had a patient who was put on topiramate and after a liver transplant because of seizures, she developed uh, asteresis. Oh, hyperaminemia which we thought was possible because she had a transplant. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of those, it's, it can be very difficult. I think what we found is that, especially in the kind of perioperative period, small doses of like Ativan are actually really helpful if they're already Keppra resistant. Uh, Lacosamide is a newer medication that tends to work really well and is fairly benign. The only issue is that it does need to be renally dosed. And so a lot of times these patients are getting an AKI and we forget about the dosing. Um, so it can get a little complex, and I think our epilepsy colleagues are also super helpful. Um, I know there's a patient right now who's in status um, who is on several medications, um, some of which are hepatically metabolized, and some have probably caused her metabolic acidosis. And so it can get very tricky in these sick patients. Um, cerebral edema. So this is what killed. Yeah, sorry. So it's... Uh, it shouldn't be. I know. It's like Lyrica, which is also a controlled substance, and we're not really sure why. Um, there were some reports um, when it was first coming out that there was, like, euphoria. That was the same thing that happened with Lyrica. And so because of this report of, like, a tiny, tiny incidence of people reporting euphoria, which was probably just people being excited that they weren't seizing anymore, um, <laughs> it's, now, it's now listed. Like, a lot of these meds are actually listed as controlled substances, which is disastrous for outpatient care. Um, because it can, you know, you can't, uh, you, you can't always like electronically prescribe it. They have to come in every month for, a, you know, paper prescription or whatever. It's it's a disaster. Um, but there's no there's no actual reason why lacosamide or Lyrica, for that matter, or Onfi, a clobazam, which is a which is a benzodiazepine, basically, um, they shouldn't be controlled substances. They're not. Lacosamide is one of the safest medications out there. You just have to check for a PR interval before you give it. Um, so cerebral edema is what kills people. Um, we know that mild cerebral edema can occur without developing intracranial hypertension or elevated ICP. And contrary to what some people think, you can develop mild cerebral edema and still be awake and not intubated. Okay? So if anyone says you cannot have mild cerebral edema because you are a grade 2, that's incorrect. Just remember that. So elevated ICP can occur in 20 to 30 uh, percent of patients with acute liver failure, and the majority of those is actually in the high-grade encephalopathy patients. Um, unlike with most disease processes that affect the brain and cause cerebral edema, this is actually caused primarily by cytotoxic edema. Um, so we know that ammonia causes the astrocyte swelling, the glutamine excitotoxicity also injures the astrocytes and the neurons. And there's actually some evidence that um, ammonia is necessary but not sufficient to cause cytotoxic edema, and it may be potentiated by cytokines or some sort of, you know, SERSI type response in the body. Um, so, you know, I was always taught we don't check ammonias, like ammonias don't matter. Um, this is why you will see that we ask for ammonia sometimes. So this was a really nice study where they looked at 165 patients with acute liver failure. And this is when it says ICH, it's not hemorrhage, it's intracranial hypertension. Um, and so they plotted days of admission and the proportion of patients who were free of intracranial hypertension, which is a, a weird way to plot it. But basically, they um, stratified people by arterial ammonia. And you can see that the patients with the highest ammonia were more, most likely to develop intracranial hypertension. So by day six, You've got 60% of patients have some sort of intracranial pressure issues, whereas the patients with a lower ammonia were just much less likely to develop ICP issues. So that's why you'll notice us asking for an ammonia. Again, I don't think we believe necessarily in trending the ammonia, um, but it does kind of help you risk stratify. In this study, this was the um, admission arterial ammonia. Um, 
colleagues, but this is the scenario where ammonia yes. is, is, I think, can be helpful in the sense that, not surprisingly, uh, to correlate to this, you know, Captain Meyerish kind of curve, is that uh, you know, on admission ammonia levels also correlate very low well outcomes. Which right. Is not that surprising because then it closed right next to these two groups. Right. And actually, in those two cases I, I showed you at the very beginning, the, one of the things I didn't point out was that the arterial ammonia for the woman who ended up never having ICP issues was 89 on arrival, and the other one was 190. So, you know, it's just, there have been several studies kind of looking at both neurological prognosis and also just overall prognosis. Um, so I agree. I, I always get a little bit of pushback from the SICU fellows being like, you know, ammonia is not all that helpful. But I think this is the one situation in which it can be very helpful. Um, as I said, there's really not much vasogenic edema, um, and uh, we'll talk about treatment of cerebral edema, but steroids are not really indicated in this, in this disease process, and that's because there's really not a lot of vasogenic edema. So this is another point that I think is really important, um, and I'm just going to harp on it as a neurologist, because this is what we're thinking about when we're risk stratifying patients. So just remember that cerebral edema does not mean the patient's herniating, right? And again, that's why a patient who's awake and altered can have cerebral edema, but does not have a blown pupil. So just think of the, the skull as a fixed vault, right? So we've got this big box, and it's got four things that are all important, but there's definitely a hierarchy. These two things are the most important, the brain and the arterial volume. And then the CSF and venous volume, well, once the brain starts taking up more space, the skull is fixed, and so CSF is going to be forced out, and venous volume is going to be forced out because of pressure uh, changes, right? So these are the lowest pressure components. And so when you're in your normal state, right, you have low ICP, that's on this, and so you can actually increase your intracranial volume by quite a bit, let's say if you Valsalva, and um, your ICP will go up a little bit. But you can actually kind of increase your intracranial volume and tolerate it quite well, right? In your compensated state, you're starting to spill out CSF and venous volume now. You're going to increase your ICP, but the, you, you know, the, um, the slope is not dramatic, right? So still, you can have increase in your volume with a, a change in the intracranial pressure, but not a massive change. Once you get to here, where you're now having to decide whether you're going to push out arterial blood or you're going to push out brain, this is where you get these dramatic changes in your ICP. And so if someone has cerebral edema, but they're compensating well, we're actually not going to start pushing mannitol and 23% and getting the patient, you know, we're not that concerned. This is a high risk patient because if it continues, they're going to turn into this, right? But we are cognizant that there are a, a number of patients, liver patients, who are going to be somewhere in this area and are going to be compensating quite nicely. Okay. What so, makes all of that harder, though, is we do not have any any high fidelity, non-invasive way of measuring people's autoregulation. If we really did, if we had something which was like a pulse ox that you could just slap on and you'd be able to get this continuous autoregulatory uh, measurement and you could target it and you would know when somebody was sitting in zone one versus zone two versus zone three. So until and unless somebody becomes very symptomatic, it becomes much harder. So some of the things that Alex is now going to go over in terms of different monitoring strategies, why is it so important to monitor these patients closely? So Alex, you're saying in zone two, you can have CT findings, so cerebral edema uh, based on a sulcida in mild, the mild to moderate, yet their ICP can be normal. Correct. And exactly. And those are usually the patients who are still kind of awake, altered, but they may be, you know, talking nonsensically mm -hmm. on their way to grade three or something. Um, they may not even be intubated yet, but they may have the cerebral edema. Is the corollary to that in classic teaching that CT scans are not very good at diagnosing cerebral edema? Yes. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the data from there. But basically, the CT, similar to how um, a pneumonia may lag on a chest X-ray, the patient clinically has a pneumonia, but you don't see it yet, and you know you wait the day or two to see it. Similarly, you can have acute development of some cerebral edema that you're not going to pick up on your CT for another day or two. And so we don't reliably use the CT to diagnose cerebral edema. If there's a clinical suspicion for it, for other reasons that I will show you, um, 
you know, we will say this patient is at high risk for de developing ICP crises, um, despite the CT looking normal. And so just having a normal CT is not necessarily super reassuring. Um, so when does elevated ICP happen? So, you know, we usually think about these patients being really, really high risk prior to transplant. And as soon as they go to transplant, we're all breathing a big sigh of relief and the, you know, we're all patting ourselves on the back. This is great, the patient made it through. Um, but I'm sure everyone here can think about at least one situation where a patient went to the OR, got a liver and came out brain dead or, you know, came out with blown pupils. So, you know, this study, um, this comes from a, an institution where they put ICP monitors in pretty much every patient that is higher, is grade two or higher, which um, we can talk about the ethics of that, but that's just their policy. And so they looked at um, 21, 22 of their patients. One patient never had <coughs> elevated ICP the entire time. Um, but they looked at 82 different episodes of elevated ICP in these patients. And three quarters of them did occur prior to transplant, but there were five, 5% 5 of the episodes actually occurred intraoperatively, and then 20% occurred postoperatively. And so, you know, we have been talking as a division about following these patients, and I'll show you some data from our own institution um, from the past 10 years or so. And I think we can do a better job of making sure to be vigilant about these patients through the operative course postoperatively until they wake up, um, because they are still at risk. So how do we prevent elevated ICP? You're going to see this ad nauseum in our notes. Head of the bed is always at 30. We try to avoid central line placement in the dominant jugular vein because remember, one of the ways that we compensate for the cerebral edema is to get rid of the venous volume. There's only two ways for the venous volume to get out. It's the right IJ or the left IJ. And so we often see patients with bilateral IJs and you know we're going to be over there kind of like ultrasounding making sure there's no thrombus because we get really worried about allowing that brain to kind of decompress if cerebral edema occurs um, avoiding hypotonic solutions you know this is like the, the classic patient who has very low sugars and we're pushing d50 and you know the intern overnight like starts a d5 drip or a d10 drip because it's just easier right and these are the patients who might decompensate um, treating fever aggressively and treating seizures if present, of course, are very important. Once you've tried to prevent ICP crises and now you have elevated ICP, and we'll talk about how you know that a patient has elevated ICP, um, you're going to allow these patients to spontaneously hyperventilate. So there are really good studies out um, looking at autoregulation in acute liver failure patients, and their optimal autoregulation is actually at a much lower CO2 than we usually think about. So we will always say 35 to 40 is the perfect CO2 because you don't want to get it too low. You're going to cause vasoconstriction and you're going to cause strokes. In these patients, they actually like to go down to 25 on their own. And that's actually in part, you know, in part it's because they're so acidotic, but in other part, it's actually that their brain likes a CO2 that's lower. Um, intubation, of course, and sedation with low-dose propofol. Um, hyperosmolar therapies, so, you know, oftentimes these patients have some renal failure and we have to talk about mannitol. 23% um, is always an, uh, an awesome um, option. It can cause some uh, hypotension, and so in patients who are, you know, very uh, sensitive to preload, we try to be careful about 23%, but you can always give a 3% bolus via a peripheral line, okay? The new policy in this hospital is you can give 3% bolus through a peripheral line for an ICP crisis. So if the pharmacy says you can't, just call us up and we will clarify it, okay? And then, you know, there are also some studies looking at the optimal temperature in these patients, and actually patients like being at a, thir a 35 or 36 temperature in terms of their autoregulation. Their autoregulation is almost perfect if you put their CO2 at 25 and you put their temperature down to like 35.8, um, which is really interesting. Uh, we can consider hypothermia induced with Arctic Sun if we need to. Um, there's some data on indomethacin that's kind of the thought behind there being an inflammatory milieu that just kind of makes the cerebral edema worse. Um, but obviously this is, has to be a big discussion because they're usually also in, you know, have some renal dysfunction. And then there's starting to come out some data that's controversial about how early CVVH may help reduce cerebral edema. And that's probably by helping to clear toxins. We know that CVVH is better than intermittent HD in general because there's fewer fluid shifts. Um, the only thing to think about when you're initiating CVVH is if it's really, really far, if the patient's really, really far gone and we're starting it really late, 
you're going to clear your osms first from your blood and it, there's going to be a lag where the you know the BUN actually can cross into the brain all that urea so the urea then has to cross back out into the blood again and there's a delay where you've taken the, the urea out of the blood and it's still in your brain and water's going to enter the brain and so you can actually get some rebound edema first before your body re-equilibrates. Uh, re and so I think that's some of these authors who have been kind of arguing for early CDVH are trying to avoid that situation where you're in this extremely hyperosmolar state at that point, and then you initiate CDVH. So just something to think about. And like I said, there's no role for glucocorticoids. That study's been done in the 80s. We definitely don't need to do it again. Uh, so I said um, there was a recent study in the last couple of years that was a randomized controlled trial randomized trial of hypothermia versus non-NALF patients. I don't know all the details, but it was a negative trial. So yeah, and hypothermia has been a negative yeah. trial in general. Um, if I'm thinking of the same one as you, it was it was kind of like as a prophylactic measure. And I think we would all, we would agree that prophylactic hypothermia, there's just way too many risks. Um, they end up with a coagulopathy. They, um, there's high risk of infection with hypothermia. I think as a last resort in your patient who is herniating despite sedation, paralysis, max mannitol on 23%, if you want to get gung-ho super aggressive about this patient, let's say they just got a liver or something and you really want to be saving them, a short trial of hypothermia may help. Um, I would say in general, the hypothermia literature, even in neurocritical care, has been a little disappointing in general. Um, there haven't been very many positive trials except post-cardiac arrest. Um, but yeah, that, I believe that paper was just prophylactic hypothermia for everyone, and I think there's a very, very small group of patients where hypothermia might help. And they should be very dire at that point. Um, so how do we monitor for ICP? So, you know, uh, Dr. Shiano already brought up the fact that CT head has low sensitivity, and that's because the edema can lag behind the, you know, the clinical change. So, you know, in the good old days and currently still at some institutions, uh, people just empirically put ICP monitors in all patients who have high-grade encephalopathy. And these are the different kinds of monitors that you might see. Uh, so a ventricular one is rarely placed in these patients because, like I said, they're, they're kicking out the CSF to make room for their cerebral edema. And so getting um, an ICP monitor into a ventricle that's slit-like is really impossible. So we rarely use those. In America, we mostly use intraparenchymal monitors, and at this institution, we only use intraparenchymal monitors. Um, so that goes about two centimeters into the brain. Um, there are subdural, epidural, and subarachnoid monitors as well. They tend to be less accurate. Um, there's a thought that they're safer, but I'm going to show you some data right now. So I went back through the literature looking at all um, papers in acute liver failure that used ICP monitors. And so this is kind of stratified epidural, subdural, and intraparenchymal monitors. You can see most are epidural and subdural because the thought has been that those are the safer ones to place. Um, and also a lot of these studies are done in Europe where they use these much more often. Um, these are the rates of incidental and symptomatic hemorrhage and uh, total hemorrhage. Now, you know, a couple of issues with combining all these papers. Some papers obviously had, you know, um, reversal with factor 7 and um, kind of aggressive continuation of factor 7 throughout the time that the patient had a monitor in. And so, you know, they did not look into strokes or other thrombotic events in these papers. Um, the other issue is that uh, not every paper routinely got a post-placement CT or a post-removal CT. And so it's probably underestimating the total number of hemorrhages. Um, but symptomatic is, um, you know, these are, these are rates that are not fabulous for young patients who um, you could potentially spare them from a hemorrhage. Um, and so, you know, as people have kind of been talking, the thought is, you know, how can we choose the correct people to put these monitors in? So, you know, there are some benefits. We know that there are higher rates of treatment for high ICP if you put an ICP monitor in. But there's actually very mixed data on whether those patients actually um, do better and survive. And so is it worth risking hemorrhage and um, treating more if it's not actually going to affect survival? So without an ICP monitor, this is a, a new kind of, in the past couple of years, has gotten um, more and more traction within the literature. Um, using non-invasive 
monitors to uh, track intracranial pressure. So um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is pupillometry. Has anyone ever seen a pupillometer? Oh, they have them in the TICU now thanks to Dr. Oropello. So the neurologists are obsessed with the pupillary exam. And I'm sure you've heard us over the phone ask, what do the pupils look like? One, it's because even, even if a patient is paralyzed, the pupillary response is always still going to continue. Um, and two, we're not going to go over this. Don't worry. I know the brain scares everyone. But um, you can tell a lot about the location of problems based on what the pupils look like. So um, we know from studies that if you have a nurse or a physician um, examine the pupil and then try to describe it, it's inaccurate with poor inter reliability. And these are some comments I got when I was a fellow getting phone calls in the middle of the night from even neurology residents. Um, the pupils are both reactive, one is kind of sluggish. The pupils are both blown but reactive, that's not a thing, and his pupils aren't <laughs> reacting but my light isn't very good, right? So these are not very, <laughs> these are, this should just put a pit in your stomach. This is like, anxiety provoking for me when I was hearing this over the phone. This is not how we should be treating patients, right? Um, and so this is what a pupillometer looks like. It's like having a touch of hepatitis C. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I, I've probably said that though, so I don't, <laughs> but yeah, you know, just a little I've cirrhosis. Those, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so this is what a pupillometer looks like, and I hope these video work, this video works. So, um, so this is what the pupillometer is actually doing. While it's looking at the pupillary response, it's measuring size accurately, because you can see this. And then it's measuring over three seconds what happens to the size, the velocity of the change, the nadir of the size, and how quickly it responds. Okay, So this is not kind of sluggish. This is actually a neurocritical care nurse. Um, and she's completely healthy, and those are her pupils. And you'll note that they are, yes, they are. Um, unequal. She's not herniating. She just has anisocoria. That's okay. Up to one millimeter is okay as long as it happens all the time. Um, this, on the other hand, is um, pupils that are unreactive, right? And you can imagine there's a lot of different stuff in between. Um, so, uh, okay. So this is the output that you get. So there's this pr proprietary NPI. Um, so the company made this a very secret algorithm, so they won't tell us what, what the algorithm is made of, but it's some combination of the max and minimum sizes, the percent change, and then the latency to changing and all sorts of other fancy stuff. The main things we look at are an NPI less than three has been shown to be associated with elevated intracranial pressure in lots of disease processes. And then your percent change, if your percent change is less than 10%, that's also associated with elevated intracranial pressure. Okay. And then this is you know, a brain dead patient who has no pupils. So this has actually been studied. Um, so we know th in, in this study, they looked at pupillometer versus nurses. Um, and so just describing the pupillary size, there was a huge amount of mismatch at the very, very small pupil. Right? And we've all seen pupils that look like dilated pupils. And we're like, I don't know, is it 1.5? Is it 2? I don't know. It's so small. Who knows? Um, so size is more accurately assessed with the pupillometer. And reactivity is also um, better assessed with the pupillometer. So you can tell in the, in the middle here, this is where we might have an argument about three versus four. But we know what one millimeter pupils look like, and we know what blown pupils look like. And then reactivity, it's really hard to tell when the pupils are already very small. right? So this is how pupillometry can help us. Um, and then in one really cool study, they looked at um, all patients in a neurological IC, global cerebral edema, some had some focal um, abnormalities. But um, in this case series, they found that abnormalities on the pupillometer were seen prior to 73% of clinical events. And the abnormalities were seen seven and a half hours before clinically blowing a pupil. Okay? That's insane. That's seven and a half hours where you can get a central line in, you can call us, you have to like find the number in your photos because you just took a photo but didn't put it in your phone. So you're gonna like look for the NEMAT hotline, you're gonna like remember how, mannitol but not remember what dose. That's a long time to prevent someone from having secondary neurological injury from, from herniating. In acute liver failure in particular, there's actually no data quite yet, which is insane, right? Um, but the pupillometer is relatively new, and um, acute liver failure is not the favorite disease process of most neurologists. Um, we're actually collecting data now. 
for what it's worth. Um, transcranial Dopplers. So uh, Dopplers can measure the uh, blood flow through the circle of Willis. And so similar to a cardiac pressure pulse, you get a um, transcranial Doppler pulse, right? So there's the systolic, upstroke, diastolic. And unlike in the cardiac cycle, you're going to see there's a longer diastolic um, and higher diastolic flow. And that's because the brain needs to be a low, um, a low resistance um, bed, right? Otherwise, two thirds of the cardiac cycle, we're not going to get enough blood to our brain and we're going to pass out you know, two out of every three seconds. So um, as the intracranial pressure rises, this is what a normal uh, transcranial Doppler flow looks like. You can tell there's almost no way of telling diastolic versus systolic, right? As the ICP goes up, you're only going to get systolic waves, and your diastolic is going gonna, is gonna to get kind of much lower. And this is like, I guess you guys use like resistive indices when you're looking at your transplanted organs, right? This is basically the same thing. We call it the pulsatility index. Um, at a point where you lose your diastolic flow, this is almost almost consistent with brain death. Um, and so you want to keep your eyes or your resistive indices kind of closer to this. You like them low. Um, so this was a patient we had in the neuro ICU. So she had global cerebral edema. She, she took ecstasy and then developed SIDH and clinically herniated um, in the ER. And so... Um, we did transcranial Dopplers on her. Uh, you can see her pulsatility indices are not terrible. Um, this is still within the realm of can be normal, but you can see the waveform. There's a high systolic peak, and then the runoff is really quite low. Um, so this is a, a high pulsatility index. And as soon as we gave her 23%, look how that changed. And so this way of in real time. Uh, measuring your pulsatility indices and getting a sense of whether the intracranial pressure is high or not. And this is something that we can easily do at the bedside and we try to do every day for your patients. Um, so there is data in acute liver failure. TCDs have been used to study autoregulation to identify whether a patient has high ICP or normal ICP and then trying to calculate ICP. Um, and there are even studies trying to use transcranial Dopplers intraoperatively. Um, to kind of help. Optic nerve sheath diameters. So the optic nerve sheath is continuous with dura, and so the subarachnoid uh, space, as pressure increases in the subarachnoid space, it gets transmitted forward. And so um, this is an example of a patient getting a tr uh, optic nerve sheath diameter. And what you're going to see is, um, this is what you get on your, with your linear probe. So you get the eyeball, and you get an optic disc here. And if you measure three millimeters behind the optic disc, you're going to measure the diameter of the optic nerve sheath. So the nerve itself is not going to change, but the sheath is going to get distended. And so this is an example where you can actually tell the difference between the nerve and the sheath because there's so much pressure. And this is an elevate, elevated optic nerve sheath diameter of almost seven millimeters. And so that's associated with elevated ICP. So we know from different disease processes that there is a correlation between an invasively measured ICP and the diameter of the optic nerve sheet. And we usually use a cutoff of anywhere between five and six. Um, definitely greater than six has been, corresponded, uh, has been corresponding quite well in terms of sensitivity and specificity, but every patient has a different baseline. And so Errol Gordon reportedly had optic nerve sheath diameters of six at baseline, and he was wandering around doing things for you guys. So um, you just have to kind of take into account that everyone has a different baseline. But we know from studies that um, it responds immediately to administration of hypertonics and to changes um, if you infuse things intrathecally in into the CSF space, um, they will widen. There is some data in acute liver failure. Um, predicting chances of herniation, um, looking at whether it translates to elevated ICP. And we know that just the number may not actually uh, detect ICP elevation, but the trend probably can. And optic nerve sheath diameters have been used intraoperatively to guide treatment, both in some case series. And then actually with uh, the second patient I told you about, she did get a liver transplant. We used optic nerve sheath diameters by anesthesia in, intraoperatively. And she did get some mannitol during that. Um, <clears throat> EEG, um, we usually put on for looking at seizures. In the pediatric population, they use EEG patterns to correlate with the hepatic encephalopathy grade because neonates are very difficult to examine, I guess. And you can see 
this is, you know, a grade one patient who had Tylenol overdose, and there's um, a little bit of what we would call slowing, but I'm going to show you this versus this person who had severe hepatic encephalopathy was a grade three, and I think it's pretty obvious, even if you did not do EEG fellowship, that this is spiky and has a lot of bumps, and this is very slow and does not have a lot of bumps. And so this can kind of help us. Obviously, um, this is an example of looking at seizure. So this is a patient who had right hand twitching. It was irregular, and so the team thought that it was maybe myoclonus and not seizure. But when they hooked up to EEG, they did see this seizure activity that was correlating with the hand twitching. This is an EMG down here. Um, but interestingly, there are characteristic changes with elevated ICP as well. And so this is an example of quantitative EEG. So this is a lot of fast Fourier, Fourier transform uh, methods that I cannot do because I'm not a physicist or whatever those people are. But what you can see here is there's this is a spectrogram. So this is amount of power in each different uh, frequency. And just by eyeballing it, you can see that there's a lot of colors here, and it kind of drops off over here, right? And similarly, there's a suppression ratio here, which is going up. So as the intracranial pressure goes up, the EEG is going to get more and more suppressed. So a neurologist can tell that this is a patient who is developing some sort of cerebral edema, but this versus this might be hard to detect, right? I can see how they might look kind of similar. In contrast, though, this is a very uh, important drop off. And you can see this is the power that's also dropped off. And so this was actually a point at which a patient with a drain, uh, the drain stopped working and the ICP went up. And so this alarmed at the bedside and uh, alerted the team to fix the drain. Um, and obviously it took them some time. And so by, by this time, it's pretty obvious that there's a difference between the baseline EEG. But quantitative can be very helpful as well. Um, quickly, I'm going to talk about jug bulb oximetry. So this is where you uh, retrogradely catheterize the, the jugular bulb. So instead of putting an IJ in down towards the heart, you put in a pediatric jugular monitor very gently up until you get to the brain. Um, you pull back a little bit. I'll show you a picture of a skull x-ray. But what this does is it gives you continuous oximetry of the output of the brain, right? And so you know the input, the oxygen saturation going into the brain by your arterial um, O2 sat. And then you know the um, end brain oxygenation. And you can kind of calculate and estimate what the brain's metabolic state is and how much oxygen the brain is consuming. And this has been used in TBI and high-grade subarachnoid hemorrhage. And I'll show you one case report using it in acute liver failure. But um, basically, this is, I know there's a lot of different things. But this is the um, retrograde IJ. And it's going up, basically, up to there, which is the jugular bulb before it turns around and enters into the transverse sinus. So it's quite high up, a little scary to place. And um, this is a case report where the patient's uh, GCS dropped on day one. It's a, kind of a confusing slide, but basically the GCS then stayed at six for the remainder of the week. And so when the GCS dropped, this team was like, well, we don't really know what to do. So um, they threw in an O2 uh, and uh, a jugular bulb. And so the O2 was about 40% here. So that suggests that the brain is using quite a bit of oxygen, right? And so how can you reduce the metabolic rate in order to prevent worsening of cerebral edema? Well, you can, here they just used hypothermia. We would probably use propofol. Um, but they started hypothermia to reduce the metabolic rate to decrease cerebral edema. And you can see over time the O2 went up. And it was pretty good around here, which is normal, around like, you know, 50, 60 to 80 percent. And then it dropped off again. And at this point, they started running fentanyl to sedate the patient. And again, the O2 goes way back up again. So this can be, you know, we can monitor this invasively, um, but obviously there are hemorrhagic risks to it. And so this is a less invasive way of monitoring cerebral blood flow and titrating your therapies to reduce cerebral edema and ICP. And so in the last minutes, I just wanted to talk quickly about um, what we found we were doing for you guys. So we looked back at 67 consecutive acute liver failure patients. Um, 45 of them progressed to grade 3 or 4. 53 of them had some sort of neurological consult. Um, 14 patients were documented as having cerebral edema. Uh, there were three ICP monitors placed. You can kind of see the numbers are sort of all over the place in terms of 
what we were doing. So some had a head CT, some had multiple, some blew a pupil, and that's why they were documented as having high ICP. And then we had kind of non-invasively, we had stuff all over the place. Um, and then this is kind of the scariest part for me is of the 30 transplanted patients, only 11 had any neurological follow-up. And the majority of those were for symptoms that occurred later, like persistent delirium, press, um, not because they had just come out of the OR and were still at risk for cerebral edema. And so, you know, we've talked about this as a division and we think we can do better for you. Um, and so, you know, in concert with uh, Dr. Oropello from the TICU and Dr. Shiano, we kind of talked about what would be a reasonable monitoring protocol for us to do for you and for the nurses to do to make sure that we're not missing development of cerebral edema and intracranial hypertension in these patients who are actually quite salvageable for the most part. Um, and so this is kind of um, a little bit of a graph of uh, what, what we would expect. So, you know, the, the nurses are already performing neurological checks. Um, in the low grades, it's very unlikely that there's going to be some pupillary abnormality. And so just doing a pupillary exam and then having a pupillometer available if you can't tell if the pupil's reactive is probably adequate. But once you start losing the exam in these high grades, um, this is where we really need to start being very careful about these patients. And so we feel like pupillometer every two hours is something that's actually not that difficult for the nurses to do. We do this all the time in our neurosurgical ICU. Um, CTs, I know these patients are super sick. We don't need to bring them to the CT scanner you know, every day. I think that's unreasonable. It's unsafe for patients, and it's not going to give us that much information. And so you know, we would say on progression, we would suggest a CT head, and then if there's any of the triggers, which I'm going to show you soon. And then transcranial Dopplers, we will do for you. Optic nerve sheath diameters, most of the CQ fellows have now been trained. It's actually super easy to do. It takes three minutes to learn. Um, and so, and then, um, you know, continuous EEG, just looking for seizures and, and, and any other concerning events. And then these more invasive things, I think, need to be a discussion between you guys and us and the other, you know, the other teams, the surgeons, just to discuss, you know, is this a high risk patient who we really need some more invasive monitoring on? Or can we can we feel comfortable that, you know, this patient is okay? And then these would be the triggers to call us. That's the hotline again. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop because I'm over. I'm sorry. Thank you. So with the new transplant ICU, the TICU, uh, is this, has this protocol started? It hasn't officially started yet. We've been speaking with Dr. Oropello. It's kind of like when we get consulted, we're kind of suggesting this with each patient as they come. But this hasn't been the official protocol yet. And I think, Dr. Shiano, you probably have more to say about that. Soon. I mean, it'd be interesting to know which modality ends up being the most useful. Because you're kind of throwing it just shotgun approach to see what sticks, right? Yeah, and I think that's kind of one of the big questions is, you know, each institution that's published on this has done one or two things. My thought is, you know, in neurologically injured patients, we often do what's called a bundle. It's an invasive bundle of four different modalities looking at cerebral blood flow, intracranial pressure, temperature, you know, EEG probe. And so this is our, like, non-invasive bundle for the liver patient to try to get a sense of what's changing first. Is that predictive of something? Because I actually think going forward from a research standpoint, it would be very interesting. But also, there's no one perfect way of diagnosing these patients. And so if two or three things are all looking bad, that might suggest like, oh, we're more worried about this patient. Whereas, and the trends are going to be really helpful, I think. And the other key thing, when we compare this to an invasive monitor, for instance, placing an ICP monitor, placing a brain tissue oximetry probe or the like, the risk of doing any of these non-invasive tests is so low that there is really no excuse when we don't have a gold standard. So if we did a combination, and to, to reiterate Alex's point, the reason why when all of us were discussing is how many modalities should we recommend. And should we should we do one or the other? Is one going to be more accurate than the other? We're extrapolating a lot of information from other disease processes. And we know that these patients have slightly unique characteristics of what's going to happen to their authorization, what's going to happen to them after they go to the OR. So bearing in mind all of that, and the fact that the risk of doing all of this is very, very low, even incremental cost, if we thought about cost and you know buying all these pupilometers, how much is that going to cost, or ultrasound. Ultrasound is an extension of 
our exam. It's it's part of contemporary critical care. So everyone should be able to do this point of care and autonomy as well. So when we go down to the the TICU, the CICU, when we're doing these consults, we'll teach the fellows and the APPs on how to do this, document it. And once we have QPAC, this is a program that uh, Dr. Orofello is trying. BI, if anybody from BI is listening, they already have QPAC there. So once you do these ultrasound exams, they will stream into EPIC as well, potentially. That's the goal. Similarly, for the pupillometer, right now, the main nursing burden is it just takes barely five to 10 seconds to actually get that reading. The actual burden is to type. So what we're also doing is working with the with the company and Epic to build an interface to transmit this data directly into Epic so our nurses don't have to document that much. So it's a multi-pronged approach, but our standard of care, what we all as a as a collaborative team feel we should be doing for these patients once we at least agree on that, roll that out, collect our numbers, see what actually works and what should stick, and eventually take this field forward. Well, we'd love to have you come back and give us a... We'd love to. So yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.